So, uh, my name is Dennis Dick. I've been a trader with Bright Trading since 1999. Uh, 15 years prop trader. And today I'm going to talk to you about information arbitrage. I'm going to look at a number of things here. We're going to talk about information. We're going to talk about what is informed order flow, what is uninformed order flow. We'll talk about the history of trading strategies, my own trading strategies and other trading strategies revolving around information arbitrage. How high frequency trading has taken advantage of this information flow and the trading adjustments and strategies that we need to um, uh, basically, uh, the trading adjustments we need to make for this new environment. Obviously, number of players that participate in the markets here. This is an older slide, but most of these particip are, players are still participating. You obviously have high-frequency traders as well participating, but um, a lot of these players all have different time frames in mind, and that's the whole key with how the market works. You get longer-term uh, funds that are investing for the long term, and they don't care so much about um, small-term price fluctuations. They care more about price impact. The short-term traders, obviously, um, we care more about uh, price and we care more about short-term price fluctuations. And that's, for the most part, how we've made our money over the years, is uh, basically providing liquidity uh, to major institutions. Let's first talk about information here. So informed orders, what are they? Um, I would define an informed order as an order that is priced correctly uh, for all new information. It's priced um, basically right now for, uh, reflecting everything that is new. Uninformed orders are basically orders that are still out there, so a limit order that would be sitting out there that has not priced in new information. For example, we had a jobs number today. Um, at 829, if you had a limit order out there and you took that limit order and had it sitting out there through the number, your limit order was all of a sudden not priced for that new information. And that's obviously what happens is you'll see you know, any orders that are mispriced get picked off very, very quickly. Um, it used to be uh, you know, us picking off those uninformed orders more if we look back to 1999 and 2000, 2001. And now obviously these orders are picked off in milliseconds, so it's the high frequency traders that uh, participate and pick these orders off more than uh, any other participant. Uninformed flow is traditionally made up of, it can be made up of any participants, um, but for the most part it's usually more fundamental traders, traders that don't care about short-term price. If you know you got fidelity, they're looking to accumulate a stock that they're you know based on fundamental valuation, um, they might be buying a stock for days and they're not that concerned with these short-term price fluctuations, but like I was saying we are and that's how we can make our money is trading against um, um, orders that are mispriced, potentially mispriced. So traditional informed participants on the other side of the of the game, um, traditionally market makers and specialists were probably the most informed uh, parties that were there. They were on the floor. They could physically see, you know, as orders were coming into the book. Um, back when I started in 1999, the specialist interacted with every single order that came on his uh, individual stock, at least on the NYSE. Um, he had the open, he had his own open book. He had, you know, the log of all the open orders that were out there, and he could gauge basically, you know, short-term supply and demand very, very well using that information. Um, there's also other traditional forum participants would be noise traders, scalpers, like we used to be at Bright Trading, day traders. We're, you know, obviously looking at all the information, the new information, trying to process it as quickly as possible. And if there's a potential, you know, to make money where we think an order is mispriced, we'll trade against that order, hoping to make money. Opportunistic traders, pair traders, arbitragers would fall into this type of category. So all of these traders represent your more informed order flow. But now, if we look at the market landscape today, many of these traditional participants, the participants that um, you know provided the majority of our market's liquidity, have been replaced by one type of participant, and that is the high-frequency trader. We look at the NYSC floor back in the 1990s, lots of action, everything happening down there. Now obviously if we look at the NYSC floor, this is what you see. I was there last year and this is typically actually what it looks like. There's not a lot going on. Everything is automated now. Really the human trader is obviously not quick enough to respond in milliseconds. So they've basically been taken out of the game and replaced by computers. 
Um, we had, if you look back to that slide, you probably had 50 to 100 specialist firms down there, LaBranch, all kinds of different ones that are gone now. And for the most part, you have four or five firms that are now doing the trading on the floor. And it's those same four or five firms that are running high frequency trading operations too. Obviously you got Gecko is a big one. Um, Knight is now obviously merged with Gecko, so they get even bigger. Goldman still has a presence down there. Um, but for the most part, um, everything is done automated now, electronically. So what is it that all these, um, you know, what is, we're going to get into the strategies here in a second, uh, but what I just want to talk about is the information that is in a quote. Typically, you look at the bid price, $25, the ask price, $25.05, and the size. So that's telling you there's 500 shares bidding at $25, 300 shares offered at $25.05. But that information... Um, is obviously just at one pinpoint in time. As new information comes into the market, these limit orders that are sitting on the book eventually have the potential to become mispriced. So basically, let's say you placed an order to buy Citigroup at $41. The moment you place that order and have it sitting out there as a limit order, that order's information is becoming old because you sent that order with a certain information that you had at the time. But now other factors are coming into play to influence the future price of Citigroup. You have S&P futures movement. If you place an order to buy Citigroup and the S&P futures all of a sudden fall five points, the odds are that your buy order for Citigroup, if it was near the NBB, is probably executed and the stock is now trading lower. So the order is basically obviously picked off because it wasn't priced for that new information. Movement on other bank stocks. If JP Morgan starts to go down, your pair traders will turn around and hit stocks like Citigroup. Um, so obviously that's going to influence it as well. Um, any other type of macro news, company specific news, um, all kinds of different things are happening all the time. But once you place that limit order out there and once you have that limit order sitting out there, it is no longer being adjusted for that new information. That's why high frequency trading has come into being more than anything because they quickly adjust their orders for all new information that's coming in. The S&P futures start ticking down. They will back their bid off on Citigroup from 41 to say 40.95 to reflect the new information of the market being a couple of points lower. Um, if the market starts to move back up, they'll move the price back up. These are almost called like envelope orders or orders that are just surrounding uh, where the fair value for the security is currently deemed. So what you see is now in this environment is that the stability of the quote itself is a lot less than it was with the traditional participants because a human being can't physically, you know, adjust their order, you know, a, a hundred or thousand times a second. A high frequency traders can. So their whole name of the game is to obviously make money. Um, and they need to make money by not getting picked off and avoiding adverse selection risk. Adverse selection risk is just the, 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 what I've been talking about here is the fact that if your order was priced at $41 and new information comes in, um, your order will be obviously transacted at $41 and maybe the stock's at $40.90. So your limit order can experience adverse selection risk in this way. And obviously, gets, you, know, you can say it's getting picked off. You know, and Obviously, high frequency traders are very efficient at moving their orders around for this new information and avoiding getting picked off. Let's look back to where this all kind of started. And it probably started more with decimalization back in 1990 and 2000. Uh, if we look back, stocks used to trade in the 16th, but in 2000, I believe it was May 2000, um, we went to decimals. So you went from basically having 16 pricing increments per handle to 100 pricing increments per handle. What that did was it fragmented liquidity, obviously, where you have, you know, now you don't have a large orders at every 16th of a point. You have a lot smaller orders that are ranging anywhere in those 100 decimal points. So liquidity is fragmented. Also, you obviously had, you know, this whole, you know, other exchanges and the breaking of the NYSC monopoly. And um, you have a number of different ECNs, 13 different ECNs trading, or, or 13 different exchanges, not ECNs, but 13 different exchanges trading stocks. You have 40 to 50 dark pools where you can transact. You have internalizing broker dealers, which we'll get to in a second, where they can transact as well. So there's all kinds of different places where price and, and transactions can occur, and there's a lot more pricing increments. So liquidity, what you would say, is now very fragmented. But if we look back at the quotes back in the day, um, you, could all, uh, you could gather a lot of information by just reading the quote. 
Um, Lucent Technologies. I used to be a, mar a basically just a market type making type of participant in this for years, from 1999 to 2000, 2001. I basically traded Lucent Technologies, and I would always be on the bid and always on the ask, uh, basically just trying to stay at the top of the queue as well as I could. Um, but if you looked at this, and this is, um, is an actual quote, so 45 and a quarter, there were 20,000 shares on the bid, 45 and 5 sixteens, 24,000 shares on the offer. That was very typical. If I was to put a bid out here for, say, 2,000 shares, I would be added into the queue. I would be behind these 20,000 shares. I would also be, be, if I put an offer out there um, for 2,000 shares, I would immediately be behind these 24,000 shares. It was true price time priority. That no longer exists because of all the fragmentation, and there's a lot of ways that high-frequency traders obviously can uh, jump the queue more than anything. So they're usually at the top of the queue. Um, if we look, though, at just back at the information source, um, this is how we used to read the quote back in the day. You can see very easily here that this quote appears ready to roll. Um, and, and, it w and basically you would see this countdown where bids would transact and this would get smaller and smaller and smaller until the last 2,500 shares are there. And often, you know, where, you know, us being bright traders would actually transact against the last 2,500 knowing that the quote is going to roll. And obviously um, then, you know, where the 45 and a quarter will become a 45 and a quarter offer. So that's why I mean by quote rolling, when the bid becomes the offer. You can see in this quoting example, there was 47,000 shares on the ask, 2,500 shares on the bid. When these transact down, out, probably more people are going to pile in and that quote is basically ready to roll. It's very easy to read back then. It's just not in the case anymore. You'll see basically lots of size on the bid, lots of size on the offer and then all of a sudden they just transact it all out um, or you know the transacts a portion of it and the quote rolls when you're not even expecting it. So um, this information is basically useless now from just reading a quote. Um, you can just see how quickly they transact. And this is what you'll typically see happen on a stock. Um, this is just Bank America, just an, uh, a download of a uh, bunch of trades here. But what you'll see is the stock will be bid 1126, offer 1127, lots of shares on the bid, lots of shares on the offer. Um, you'll see it often transact between the quote you'll see prices like 1126.97 you'll see uh, prices transact 1126 on FINRA anytime you see FINRA here trade reporting facility these orders were executed off exchange this is dark trading it's made up of dark pools it's made up of internalizers um, anything that's happening off exchange is reported to the FINRA tape um, it's almost 40% of your volume now. So where this volume was almost zero, if we go back a decade ago, or very low, um, now it's making up basically four out of 10 trades off exchange. Um, what you'll also see happen is that you'll see the quote stabilize, and you'll see a lot of transaction often happen on FINRA, where there's basically just internalizers who are off exchange market makers transacting between the bid and the ask. So they're looking to lean on the bid and to lean on the offer and make the one penny spread. They're always at the top of the queue because um, for the most part these internalizers buy order flow from retail brokerage houses and we were talking about this a little bit yesterday but they come out here and they buy order flow from retail brokerages and uh, trade directly against that. So if somebody sends a market order from TD Ameritrade to buy 100 shares or 1,000 shares, um, it will, that market order would have, his, it would have typically 10 years ago transacted against whoever was on the 1127 offer. That doesn't happen now because that order is actually routed to an OTC market maker who can then match the best quote. And what they do is they sell it at 1,000 shares for their own account. If a market order comes in to sell, uh, at 1126, they can do the exact opposite and become a buyer there at 1126. So they can basically queue jump um, the, the whole order queue. So they're just jumping it all day long. Um, you can see here, um, sometimes they offer sub penny price improvement or a few cents of price improvement. That's how they justify the practice. They're saying, oh, we gave a better price than the NBBO was at the time. So what are you complaining about? Well, what happens is, is that the participants that are bidding or offering or sitting out there in the queue don't get filled, they get discouraged, and they realize that the only time they're getting filled on their limit orders is when the quote is rolling and it rolls right through them. And that's what you see. 
If you actually stopped and analyzed this, and I've never seen a paper done on this yet, I would love to see a paper done on this, but if you ever stopped and analyzed the quote, you'll see lots of FINRA, and then all of a sudden, you see everything trade on the exchange with no FINRA quotes. Well, the, what's happening here is this quote is rolling in this second. So everything is all of a sudden, you know, the demand has gotten too high on the offer and the quote's about to roll. Every co-located high frequency trading firm can probably get a better feel for that, but the internalizers can get a good feel for that too. So they all get a feel for when the quote is about to roll and then quickly transact against the bid so that they can be at the top of the queue when it becomes 1125 to 1126. So where we used to read the quote, you used to be able to read it like this when we could roll, they're doing it in milliseconds. So you don't typically see, you know, the, all of a sudden, you know, there's only a few hundred shares on the bid and you know it's going to roll. That happens so quickly that it's just not even you know capable for a human to process um, when that quote is going to roll and not only that um, the other thing is the stability of the quote is so much less too because you have all those participants that were bidding at 1126 realizing the quote is going to roll and they're getting the hell out of the way they're going to cancel all their bids so a lot of times what you'll see is a hundred thousand shares bid at 1126 maybe only five or seven thousand shares transact and actually the quote rolls then. So where before, usually if you had 100,000 shares in the bid, it was a real 100,000 shares. It's not anymore. It's a lot of order cancellation. And they're trying to avoid adverse selection risk. And none of this is, you know, we're saying this is wrong. This is just the current market environment that we're dealing with. It's much different than it used to be. And you can see in these milliseconds, um, it's a big advantage to know when this quote is going to roll because you can always be leaning on the bid or leaning on the offer and having a free look the other way. These orders are basically the market insurance. Um, I could just pop through all this, but basically these orders, this 1126 and 1127, um, the limit orders that are sitting on the exchange are the insurance that the internalizers and the high frequency traders are leaning on. They are looking to make risk-free profits. They are not in the game to lose money. And that's why you see these firms making money every single day. They come out with their quarterly reports and they made money 90 out of 90 days. Well, it's because they have a lot more information than we do. So market making today, much different. Most of the liquidity, like I was just saying, is fleeting liquidity. The high frequency traders and, and internalizers trade between the quote they queue jump. Um, they obviously have a co-location advantage as well. So if there's whatever orders that do get to the exchange while they're co-located there, and you know, obviously they're going to be able to get those to those orders first too. Um, and high frequency trading market makers execute against the quotes only when they're about to roll. So basically they are liquidity providers. And then when the quote's about to ro roll, they're liquidity takers. So how in a, when you probably net it all out, they're probably not providing much liquidity at all. But um, it is what it is. So by passively participating in the quote, so if you just have your order sitting out there, your limit order just sitting out there, it is a huge information disadvantage for you because your order, you cannot process when that quote is about to roll. So you won't be able to cancel in time to get out. You won't be able to predict if the S&P futures all of a sudden sell off two or three points. All you can do is, you know, get picked off. So that's why at Bright Trading, we've been saying this for the last three years, it's very important to be very careful when you're placing limit orders out there or to basically not sit limit orders out there as much as you possibly can. So this is the biggest trading adjustment that I can tell you guys here today. I, and for those who've heard it before, it's a good refresher. I'm going to keep pounding this into your head because I do the same thing too. I'll sit limit orders out there and I won't get executed unless it blows right through me for the most part or the quote rolls through me. Um, even today, I can tell you, I was actually, you know, I serious, I don't even learn, so I, sometimes I don't even listen to my own words. But um, sometimes, you know, how I used to do it, and I still do it a little bit this way, is I'll, find, I'll look through charts in the pre-market, I'll find certain levels where I think, you know, the stocks might, you know, tend to obviously have um, uh, resistance or support. And what I might do is throw out, you know, um, a, a, a limit order out there, because if the stock gets up there, I think it might reverse at that point. So basically... Um, and you could say, oh, well, what's your, you know, thousand share of Facebook order? What does that really make a difference? Well, it makes a big difference in the first few minutes because most of the liquidity out there is fleeting liquidity. Probably they say high frequency trading um, makes up 70% of executed volume. I'm going to gather it probably makes up to 95 to 99% of quotes out there. So the majority of your quotes are probably high frequency quotes. 
I've already said those aren't very stable. They move. Those quotes change a lot. They're going to get out of the way for adverse selection risk. So when you get a stable quote, when you get a quote that is stable sitting out there, even if it's only 1,000 shares, it's something that everybody can lean on. Um, so it's not surprising that Facebook got all the way up, and I'm not saying my 1,000 share order stopped it, but the only way for me to get Phil on that 1,000 shares of Facebook that I was selling up there at 25.77 today would be as if it went 25.77 bid. I would probably never get filled just being on the offer and you know a trading there because you'd have everybody stepping ahead of my order. So really, by me sitting the order out there, it can actually have a little bit of an impact on the price. Um, a couple trader friends of mine used to say 100 shares is like 1,000 shares in this market, when you bet, or, or, or like it used to be. So when you bid for 100 shares of something, it has as much stability um, and, and obviously um, supporting the quote as probably 1,000 shares did 10 years ago. Uh, a 1,000 share order probably has as much stability as maybe a 10,000 share order did 10 years ago. So um, if you're looking to sell a stock and you're sitting your limit order out there, you're not helping your case. You're showing your intentions and you're showing your intentions the opposite way um, and, it, and obviously you're only going to get filled when you know the quote is rolling up. So the biggest adjustment that you really need to make here is sitting limit orders out there is a very very dangerous game. What I like to use instead, I like to use more marketable limit orders where you actually take liquidity. Market orders are always dangerous, so I don't like to just send a market order. It's like a blank check, especially in a high-frequency trading world where quotes change so rapidly. You might send a market order to buy the stock, think you're going to get 25, and you fill 25.10, or even worse. So I don't want to use market orders, but what a marketable limit order is, um, is just pricing. It's an aggressively priced limit order. So if the stock is offered at 25, I might put my bid at 25, or maybe if I really want it, I might put my bid at 25.01 knowing that I'm probably going to lift the offer. Um, if the quote moves quickly, I may miss it, but I'm not going to be filled at a horrible price by sending a market order. So I tend to take liquidity when I can. That's the better thing. And that's, and that's protecting you from doing a number of things. You're obviously not divulging the information of your own limit order, and your or limit order can't be used as insurance for all these other participants which have more, who have more information than you. Um, just a question here. What do you do when you are in stocks that have low volume and large bid ask spreads? That is a great question. And um, what I typically say is I try to avoid trading those stocks, but I still trade some illiquid stuff too. But what I'll say is when the spread tightens, don't be afraid to pay it. If you're seeing, you know, the average quote on or the average spread is 10 cents or 15 cents, all of a sudden it narrows to three or four cents. Don't be afraid to lift the offer because if you're sitting there bidding or chasing it, they might just move it on you. As soon as you place a bid out there, a lot of times you'll see the offer transact. And that's because the new information of your limit order entering the market has just been divulged to the other participant and they think you want to buy the stock and they're going to try to make you pay up for it. So the best thing you can do on more illiquid securities is to um, wait for the spread to tighten as much as you can and then don't be afraid to pay it. But I don't like to just sit limit orders out there for all of those reasons above because it can use that information against you. So yeah, so he says you have to be more vigilant in uh, watching it when you want to get out. I'd say so, or you can use a discretionary order, something like that. You can automate the process too. I mean, um, you can have you know an automated algorithm to automatically lift the offer when it tightens or something like that. There's different ways to do it. If you can't physically watch it, you can always automate that as well. But um, obviously, um, if you can physically watch it, that might be the best, best way to do it. Um, filter trading is something I'm just kind of going through the history of um, you know, some of my trading strategies, too. And this is something I did from probably 1999 to 2005. Um, I'd use filters or queries, and I still use those today. Um, you can call them scanners to find uh, buy or sell flow. Um, or, or I basically use it to just um, back in the day to find order imbalances. I'm, I'm not talking about the imbalances that they post at the end of the day. Actually, order imbalances where um, you know there's 25,000 shares on the bid and only 1,100 shares on the offer. Well, I would probably try to lean on that $20, lift the 2002, and try to get a free look at the upside, knowing that I was probably quick enough to hit the 25,000 shares at 20 if I was in trouble. So I'm really only risking two cents. 
It's not the case anymore. You're trying to lean on a 25,000 share bid, and you know what happens. It transacts out in a millisecond, and then you're sitting there, and then other people were leaning on it too, and it's like, oh boy, and now there's going to be a race to get out of this stock, and it can get really ugly, and I'm going to show you a chart of that here in a second. Um, but basically, what I'm just trying to say is high frequency traders like to lean on the size, and they use this as insurance. So talking just about this whole high frequency trading tractor beam that I talk about, this is when you actually do get a real uh, sizable order in the market, like a real order in the market. Um, maybe it's an institutional order sitting to buy a stock for 100,000 shares or selling a stock for 100,000 shares. You'll have a number of participants that are aware, very aware of the order buck. You'll have high frequency traders leaning on that order. You will have short term opportunistic traders leaning on that order. You will have anybody that thinks that they can transact and get a free look at the other side um, and they can get out quick enough trying to obviously lean on that order. The only one that is really efficient at doing it though is the high frequency trader. Um, I'm going to skip this mechanics, but basically what happens here is um, you get a bid, and this was the case back in Citigroup. I'm going back, I think, about a few months ago. But um, anyways, actually, it's probably, it probably last year because stock was trading at 29.80. But stocks bid at 29.80 for 100,000 shares. You can see here it traded there for about seven or eight minutes, right in front of it. 29.80, 001 trades, 29.80, 29.81. Everybody leaning on this institutional order of 29.80. Big lean party. Um, they quickly sell out and try to sell the stock at 29.81, 29.82, 29.83, scalping for pennies, making rebates, um, just knowing uh, they can quickly get out and hit the 29.80 bid if um, the market starts to sell off or if some bad news hits or whatever. Um, what happens is, though, in this case, that the 29.80 bid transacts, transacts very, very quickly. It goes in a split second, and all of a sudden, everybody that was leaning on this bid is like, ah, and you see the stock just tanks off of that. You'll get people coming on the news and saying, oh, what's happening? What's the fundamental news on Citigroup? Why did it just fall 40 cents? Or people on Twitter, you know, speculating, oh, it was because this happened or this happened. No, it wasn't. It was because somebody was bidding for 100,000 shares at 29.80. It was all related to order flow. They were all leaning on it, and all of a sudden, it transacts out very, very quickly, and um, they all get caught, and they're all scrambling for liquidity. And you can see this huge spike in volume here at this time, too. Part of that was obviously, and I don't think it was 100,000 shares. It was actually a million shares. I wrote this wrong. It was actually a million shares that were bid here. So it was absolutely enormous because you can see the volume spike. The million transacts out. And then everybody that was leaning on it needs to transact out of their volume, too. And the price just tanks. So where traders used to look at these and lean on these orders before, it just doesn't work anymore for human traders. And if you're trying to lean on order size, you should have been in the game 10 years ago. The game is for high frequency traders only now. Um, better strategies are to predict that it's probably going to transact out very quickly. It's going to probably catch a few people by surprise. So maybe you want to actually be selling into that order. Maybe you don't want to be leaning on it like we traditionally did. Maybe you want to be selling before this washout happens. So a lot of times what you'll see is the transacts out and you'll see a vicious spike through. Now this was a big one. Sometimes they're only a dime or so. But um, this was a, a substantial sell-off here. And this will happen in about a second. And you can see the washout and then eventually it comes back up and starts trading where it used to be. But all of this was just because everybody was leaning on that order. And that's really all high frequency trading is. It's all about, you know, if it isn't arbitrage or news arbitrage, it's or picking off, you know, it's about leaning. It's about being, you know, leaning and using other orders as your insurance so that, you know, you don't lose money. Now, closing and balances, this was another strategy here too. And I just got to check the time here too. I don't want to go too long. But closing and balances used to be posted at 340. They changed that two years ago. They're now posted at 345. Um, the typical strategy though, and if you don't know what an imbalance is, I'll quickly explain it to you. Um, basically, all of the MOC, the market on close orders, are, um, and this is basically sent by institutions or by people, opportunistic traders, it might be anything. But any market on close order that is uh, to buy the stock on the market on close would be posted as part of a buy imbalance. Any market on close order to sell a stock would be posted um, as the sell imbalance. So if there's 10,000 more shares to buy than sell, it will post as a 10,000 share buy imbalance. This is a lot of information that was very, very relevant um, because when it came out at 340, all of a sudden it's saying there's a huge buy imbalance to buy this stock on the close. Well, opportunistic traders would come in, buy the stock ahead of those imbalances, and then obviously try to sell into the close, into that market on close imbalance. 
Um, basically, the whole way was just to provide offsetting liquidity at the close. That's how we were making money off of this. Um, it's different today. Now they're posted publicly at 345, but you can actually subscribe to this information much earlier. Um, these imbalances start coming out on the floor at 2 o'clock. Um, so basically anybody that's getting the information at 345 is getting very old information. That's already been available to every informed participant out there. And um, when you see it at 345, what's already happened is it's probably already had its move. Um, and it's probably pretty much priced in. And sometimes what can happen is actually these uh, trades can become crowded. They can become so frequently crowded or oversubscribed to that the imbalances can actually flip where you'll see you know, a 100,000 share buy imbalance becomes a 100,000 share sell imbalance. Um, I also believe there's games being played with these. So these imba this imbalance information is very, very difficult to use, at least the 345 published imbalance. Um, there is an exception here, though, and the exception is on the third Friday or option expiration of the month. And also the end of the quarter days, they tend to be pretty good, too. I know we just had an option expiration Friday, and it was actually a pretty good one. A lot of the imbalances were real. Um, this is important information to know. Why is it that you know this works better on the third Friday or at the end of the quarter? That's simply because there's more fundamental traders, more longer-term institutional traders, um, option traders, um, squaring off positions. There's so many more reasons out there that they typically outnumber all of the short-term traders. They're outnumbering your high-frequency guys. They're outnumbering your short-term opportunistic guys. They're outnumbering any type of market-making participant that's out there. So there's the pie is basically just bigger. So the high frequency traders um, obviously are making a lot of money on these days too, but there's just more to go around. So some of our traditional strategies by providing liquidity to some of these um, and some of these days still work. But I would say 19 out of 20 days they don't. Um, but on the third Friday of the month, they often still do. Now, it's not a guarantee that it's always going to work on those. But more often than not, our traditional strategy of providing liquidity into those offsetting or into those uh, market on close orders um, tends to work. Um, opening indication uh, prices. Uh, basically, years ago, I was looking back even before this from 2000 to like 2008, um, the stocks were, New York, New York Stock Exchange stocks uh, would publish an opening indication price, where if the stock was going to open up, so let's say the stock closed at $25. If it was going to open up, they would publish an opening indication price so showing 25 to 25.50. If it was going to open down, they would publish an opening indication price of 24.50 to 25. Um, that was a lot of information. I actually had my own algorithm running that would pick off any ECN orders or any um, pre-market orders that were sitting and they were priced out of range. Um, so basically, if somebody, if all of a sudden an opening in indication or opening uh, indication was priced 25 to 25.50, and I could buy the stock at 24.95 in the pre-market. Uh, my algorithm would do that. Um, and then it would obviously try to sell into that opening price. It didn't always work because sometimes those opening prices could change or those opening indication prices could change. But for the most part, it um, usually made money. That doesn't work anymore either. It's much different than it used to be. Um, opening imbalances are actually published at 8.30 in the morning to 9.30, and they are continuously adjusted. Um, and they actually publish at 9.28, two minutes before the open, they publish an opening indication price where actually um, they will say this stock is predicted to open, Johnson Johnson is predicted to open at 92.50. That will adjust continuously too. So as more sell orders come in, that opening indication price will fall. As more buy orders come in, that opening indication price will rise. That's information that's available right on your ready system. It's great information to know. And what you'll see is often little spikes up or down at 928 as this new information is published. Um, high frequency traders obviously have specialized in picking off any limit orders that are outside of the range. But what you have now is people that are manipulating these opening indication prices or trying to fool those high frequency trading programs. So you have basically high frequency traders trading against other high frequency traders and trying to pick off, you know, so they're saying, oh yeah, pick me off. But meanwhile, you know, they may have tried to manipulate the opening indication price higher by placing limit orders out there on the NYSE. It's actually illegal it's to manipulate any price. It's called layering, but that still doesn't mean that they don't do it. So biggest thing is, obviously, don't get caught up in some of these games. Like, um, if you're sitting, obviously, one thing is if you're sitting your limit order out there, you run a very high risk of getting picked off at 9.28 when that indication price comes out. The second thing is, um, um, obviously, 
these games are played. So don't just believe that because the stock says, oh, it's going to open at 9250 that it is. So don't be going and running, picking off a 9220 J and J buy order 50 cents above the market because you think it's opening 30 cents higher. Um, that's not advisable either because those opening indication prices change a lot, sometimes in the last second or sometimes even after the 930. Until the stock opens, that price will continuously adjust. So that information is difficult for us to use too, but um, big thing again here, look at the, you know, what I'm really trying to pound your head today is that by even having these pre-market limit orders out there, you risk getting picked off there too. Um, arbitrage. So a lot of high frequency traders, you know, do a lot of different arbitrage. We used to specialize in all this stuff, risk merger arbitrage. We used to do um, intermarket arbitrage. I can remember Arb Arbing Canada stocks, Toronto Stock Exchange stocks versus the New York stocks. Um, market fragmentation arbitrage, uh, basically just, you know, price, mispricings on different exchanges. Um, gap arbitrage, which was a liquidity replenishment point sitting out there and something would hit a liquidity replenishment point and um, that's something. And then share class arbitrage with obviously different classes of securities that are actually the same stock news arbitrage. This is all the different types of high frequency trading arbitrage that they do. Um, and for the most part, all this stuff they do keeps the market more efficient. I would label this all as kind of like the good high frequency trading, the stuff that actually helps to uh, create more efficient pricing. And like I said, where we used to do a lot of this stuff, where human beings used to do a lot of this stuff, um, these strategies are now monopolized by high frequency traders. They're just too quick. They're too quick. Um, but they do overshoot too. And, and that's the one thing you've got to remember in this world too. Just because, you know, oh, high frequency traders are better than us. Well, a lot of people doing high frequency trading that don't know what they're doing either. So you have those top firms that are very, very good at it. But even the top firms, we saw what happened with Knight um, back in, you know, June of last year when they had an algo run wild on them and lost 400, you know, million dollars in a matter of 30 minutes. Um, so accidents happen, you know, new algos go bad, things happen. Um, but sometimes, you know, just, you know, somebody might bring something online and it's honestly just not that good of an algorithm. Um, and it's not only just high frequency algorithms, I should say any type of, you know, participant that's running just an algo. So I'm not just limiting this to high frequency. The high frequency trades are obviously the quickest ones, but other people are running algor news algorithms too. Um, maybe even some other bright traders are doing this as well. Um, but what I see often happen is that a lot of times these news algos or these algos that are trying to trade off of news headlines overshoot. They actually sometimes um, basically just overshoot the price. What happened back on February 14th in Procter and & Gamble, and, I, and this is just one example, I see this happen all the time. Um, the stock was trading at 76.78. Some news came out of a slight citing a slight devaluation. Um, they were guiding lower citing a devaluation of the Venezuelan currency and they guided a couple cents lower. What's well, the news algorithm sees this, reads this, oh, PG guides lower, all of a sudden sends a huge sell order into the market to try to pick off any orders that aren't priced for the new information. And obviously the stock trades down significantly here, down all the way to 70, uh, from 76 to 78, all the way down to 74.10. Um, stock quickly rised uh, after that back up to over $76. So this news algorithm knocked $2.70 off there for a slightly lower guidance Procter Gamble. Low beta stock. You as an opportunistic trader might look at this and say, well, that's ridiculous. Procter & Gamble, very low beta stock. I don't see this as a big in impact here on their earnings at all. And I might you know, want to buy it down there. So sometimes they overshoot and sometimes they will give you opportunities like this. So this is an example of an algorithm that is just too aggressive. The pricing was too aggressive. Knock the stock down two dollars and seventy cents, and the price immediately back up. So um, sold a lot of stock down here at seventy four ten. Uh, you can see thirteen hundred shares, thousand shares, thousand shares. It looks like you know maybe ten thousand shares down there. Um, stock was immediately back to seventy six. So just on this part of the order, it looks like they threw away at least two points on ten thousand shares. Threw away about twenty grand there. Here you go, twenty grand sitting there. So I mean, there is opportunities out there, and you might say, "Oh, well, I should have had a limit order out there," and I could have. And maybe that's the case. Maybe you could set a fishing order out there if you wanted to. But again, you run the risk of real news happening and getting picked off. So um, that's you know something that is sometimes scary to do as well. But a lot of times, what you'll have is you know sometimes even after hours of pre-market trading, I have a few seconds to think about this. It's like, well, this is stupid. This has went too far, too fast. Um, 
so a human being we can respond in probably a second or two even sometimes sometimes people are faster maybe i'm a little bit slower might take me more than a second or two but there's some really quick thinkers out there and i think uh you know human processing time is probably about a half a second to a second so literally you could a human being could probably respond to this in a second or two and maybe potentially actually profit on this um just from the opportunity that it's presenting so what is working today? I've talked about all this stuff, you know, that isn't working anymore, but what is really working today? Um, I would say um, opening market fragmentation, which um, basically is uh, looking at the opening market. Um, I'm not sure. Or, you get, you get the, at the opening, there's obviously the most risk and the most opportunity. And I still feel that um, at the stock market opening is when I probably make... 60 to 70 percent of my money throughout the year probably in the first five minutes of trading so there's a lot of risk there but there's a lot of return there and it's all about knowing your levels knowing about you know where this stock's probably going to run to support or resistance because in the open there's liquidity is a lot less there's a lot more risk out there so there's not a lot of high frequency traders providing liquidity they don't want to they don't want to trade when there's risk so that gives you as an opportunistic trader and that's what you are at bright trading your opportunistic traders that gives you an opportunity to come in and play maybe a little bit of a market making role or play you know um you know just a, or maybe get an ex excellent execution on one of your pairs or something else uh because the liquidity is so much less and stocks are chopping around a lot so using your own strategies you know there's a number of different strategies whether you're using technicals or whether you're using relative valuations um you do get great opportunities at the open to get an excellent price and an excellent execution um swing trading type strategies are working and this is the biggest thing i can tell all of you guys if you're you know if you didn't take anything out of the day besides the whole limit orders are dangerous thing um lengthening your time horizon is absolutely critical you're coming in here scalping for pennies i just got done telling you you know the high frequency traders have monopolized the order queue they're always on the first on the bid first on the offer they have monopolized the spread you as a trader have to now pay that spread it is the number one toll it's even greater than the commissions for the most part than um anything else that's your number one expense is the spread so by paying the spread, if you're paying, you know, one cent, two cent spreads or whatever you're paying, obviously your expenses are going to be a little bit be high, higher than they were 10 years ago when we weren't paying spreads. So higher, you know, expenses means you have to make a little bit more on your trading. So instead of jumping in here and scalping for nickels or scalping for pennies, you need to scalp for a little bit more than that. Depending on the stock, I like to employ a risk return ratio of two to one. If I'm going to, it's going to cost me a penny to get in the trade. If it's going to cost me a half a cent, penny and a half to get in the trade. If, you know, um, I'm going to risk a nickel, I'm really risking six or seven cents. Um, I want to make like two to one. So if I'm risking five, six, seven cents, I want to be making 14 or 15 cents in that trade. If I'm risking 30 or 40 or 50 cents, I want to be making a dollar on that trade. So I try to employ the two to one risk return ratio. It's helped me in my trading. And that's, you know, what I kind of use as a rule of thumb for myself. Maybe you have a different risk return ratio, but the whole key here is like with the two to one risk return ratio is I can be wrong twice for every time I'm right and still be breaking even, not obviously including commissions and stuff, but for the most part, be scratching out um, even if I'm only right one out of every three times. And I'm not that, you know, perfect here. So obviously I'm going to have be wrong lots of times. The whole key is still discipline. The, you know, the core concepts are still the same. You need to be able to cut those losers when you can, obviously, and as quickly as you can and be able to recognize uh, when you're on the wrong side of the trade. How do you know when you're on the wrong side of the trade? You start losing money. That's how you know you're on the wrong side of the trade. Um, level trading is something that we talk about um, on our pre-market info show um, over at with Benzinga that um, we, me and Joel talk about every morning. We Joel's a big um, Joel O'Connor, who was uh, my trading mentor. Uh, back in 1999, he was the one that founded the Bright Trading Office in Detroit. He now uh, is, uh, works over at Benzinga, um, which I'll talk to you about here at the end of the presentation. And uh, we do a morning show every morning. We talk about different levels. We really focus on stock levels where support or resistance has come into play um, just from technical charting patterns and, and whatnot. But by knowing these levels, by you know studying them early on before the market opens, when the stock gets there to our level, we're more prepared you know, to obviously... Uh, make a trade instead of just looking at a chart all of a sudden and trying to make a split decision uh, we're prepared ahead of time so 
the levels have really worked well actually now the execution is a little bit different like I said I don't want to set my limit orders out there so you need to maybe be watching those levels and then placing the order out there or using a discretionary or order or using some type of algorithm because you don't want to show your hand and that can actually work against you like I was saying today in Facebook which I probably should have had an algorithm sending that order instead of me sitting my limit order out there and not getting executed on you know what could have been the high of the day Technical trading is still working. There's a lot of algorithms run out there off of technicals. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will see stocks that are breaking out continue to work. Stocks breaking down continue to work. So technical trading is actually working very well. It's maybe not working in that super um, low time frame of seconds to minutes. But when you start getting in hours to days or even to weeks, and the one big advantage I can tell you here is that there isn't a lot of participants trading in this uh, time frame of hours to days. There's lots of investing who are time frames of weeks to months to years. There's lots of short term, obviously high frequency traders participating in seconds and milliseconds. But if you're sitting in that, you know, just getting outside of you know minutes to hours or to even you know one or two days. Not a lot of competition in that space. And I think there's some great opportunities here. And my better trades are basically those trades that I'm holding for the majority of the day, like real day trades. Dividend strategies still continue to work. You'll see stuff, I'll talk about AT&T and Verizon, how they typically will run up a couple days before they're going ex-dividend. And they will typically sell off a couple days afterwards. Sentiment trading, Probably the number one thing I try to use in my overall trading, especially from my swing trading and, you know, I'm talking day trading, like longer term trades than minutes, um, is feeling which side the short term herd is on. I'm always trying to fade the crowd. I'm always trying to get a feel for, okay, well, this is crowded this way. And when you start to see a breakdown, it's probably going to wash out very quickly because there's too many short term participants on one side of the trade. Um, end of day follow through works well too. Um, I'm starting to run short on time so it's going to be hard for me to really explain all of this here in detail. Um, but basically um, end of day follow through is I'm just talking um, if the S&P futures are up 10 points they'll usually close strong. If they're down 10 points they'll usually close weak. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. The number one reason might be ETF rebalancing, where you get leveraged ETFs that actually have to physically buy on up days. They have to sell on up days. They all, always have to be um, adjusting their holdings according to um, where the market is uh, doing because those leveraged ETFs are based on one day performance. So they need to always be um, three times every single day. And obviously as the prices are moving around, they um, all of a sudden aren't priced or they don't have the right holdings. So they have to buy or sell according to that. I talked about levels. Those continue to work. Dividend strategies again, uh, what I was just talking about before. You'll see the ex-dividend date here on AT&T from October last year. and It's shocking how many times this actually works. If you're just looking short, short term, you might not see it. But when you start going out and looking at these you know, month charts, you can see while well, it goes ex-dividend, it's weak. And then it's getting up before the ex-dividend date. Oh, it's stronger in the ex-dividend date. Oh, it's weak after the ex-dividend date. Why is that? People are coming in there to jump in and capture the dividends. They want to take the stock home, get the dividend, and get rid of it. So they don't want to hold it for 90 days. They want to hold it for two or three days. Or they want to hold it just overnight and get the dividend. Um, sometimes you'll see these things actually reverse the day before. So you got to be somewhat careful of actually taking them home. But... You know, this is, we're all living the probability. So that's what Rob always says, and it's true. Us as traders can never be right 100% of the time. We're never going to be wrong 100% of the time. We're just looking for edges. We're trying to look for statistical correlations. We're trying to look through the his, historical patterns and see if there's a relationship. And what I can tell you is, from my experience over the last 15 years of trading, typically when your higher beta or when your lower beta stocks the AT&T's, the Verizon's, um, the Johnson & Johnson, the Procter & Gamble's, the stocks that people probably are owning more for the dividends, they will typically have run-ups ahead of their ex-dividend dates, and they will typically have sell-offs after their ex-dividend dates. Other things being equal, obviously, if the market's really rallying, they're going to rally for sure. But, you know, if the market's flat, everything's being equal, more often than not, they will show strength ahead of the ex-dividend date and weakness after. Same thing with Verizon, just another chart showing you the same type of thing. Um, I'm going to skip this stuff here because we're running short on time. Sentiment indicators. What do you use to gauge sentiment? Um, greatest thing you can use is probably CNBC. I always look on there. They'll have analysts on there talking. When four out of five analysts come on and they're saying, you know, 
I like this stock, buy it, I automatically think it's time to sell it. Um, stock twits is a great contrarian indicator, to be honest with you. Um, if you can look on there and everybody's saying, oh, I love this stock, I gotta own it, I gotta own it, I gotta own it, you can be pretty sure that the majority of short term participants that want to own that stock already do, and it might be getting time for a reverse on it. Twitter, same thing. Now you can look, you know, you can use the dollar signs on Twitter there too, and it's the same type of thing. Um, you can gauge, and more often than not, um, when somebody tweets something out, they, usually what happens is they do the trade and then they tweet it out. So it's like um, obviously slower, it's slower information, but it can give you a feel for when there's a top or when there's a bottom. I'll often see, oh, the stock's going to the moon, there's no stopping it. Um, all of a sudden, you know, a few minutes later, that's after somebody tweeted something like that, that the stock will actually reverse. Um, there's actually some hedge funds that um, have specialized in this. They actually, you know, use tweets and they've used them as contrarian indicators. So this is great sources of free information as well, not only for sentiment, but you do get great information from stock twits and from Twitter and from CNBC for that matter. Um, as news is breaking, they break it very quickly. I mean, if you're, you know, got a Twitter account, you can, you know, follow so many different people and the news on the earnings will break often before you'll hear it on CNBC. Um, the social uh, media is incredible at breaking news very, very quickly. I can even remember when uh, Whitney Houston died. I, res I got a pop-up on my Twitter or whatever saying Whitney Houston's dead. And I'm like, oh, really? You know, and then I flipped it on uh, CNN and they're just covering regular news. I'm like, well, that's got to be wrong because CNN would obviously be covering Whitney Houston dead. And then all of a sudden, about 30 seconds later, breaking news, CNN, Whitney Houston, you know, dead. So um, it just shows you um, how quickly, you know, and how often social media breaks the news before. Why is that? Well, CNN has to go verify. They have to go, like, verify the news. They can't just break any rumor. But, you know, Twitter, stock twits and all that, they don't have to verify any of that stuff. So they hear the rumor, they publish it, and somebody tweets it out. So that's why it's quicker at breaking information and breaking news. Um, so basically, what I'm going to say is six tips here. So minimize your information leakage. That's what I'm pretty much te teaching you the most. Use more active orders as opposed to passive orders. Trade more liquid stocks if you can. If you have to trade the ill-liquid stocks, obviously wait for the spread to tighten. But whatever you do, especially, especially on the ill-liquid stocks, is don't show your hand because your 1,000 share order on Facebook might be influential. Your 1,000 share order on some little you know, Mickey Mouse stock that trades 10,000 shares a day is gargantuan. You cannot show your hand on that kind of stuff. So do not place passive limit orders on this stuff unless you, you know, um, well, don't, I just suggest not to use passive limit orders at, or, at all on uh, more illiquid stocks. Spread tightens, pay it. Lengthen your time horizon. Don't trade in milliseconds. Don't trade in seconds. You might want to even avoid trading in minutes. But if you're trading in hours to days, you're probably in pretty good shape. I'd say minutes is probably pretty safe too, like, you know, longer than one minute. You know, if you're in 10 to 20 to 30 minutes in your trades, you're probably in the right area, probably in the right time frame. Um, use directed orders. I didn't touch on this, but um, a directed order is basically um, upright trading. We can obviously route our orders direct to where the exchange is. So if it's offered on ARCA, I will lift the offer with ARCA. If I lift it with something else, there might be, you know, I might tip, if, like if I'm trying to lift it with INET, well, first that order pings INET. Well, as soon as it pinged INET, it's tipping everybody off that, oh, somebody's coming to take the offer right now. Maybe I should jump ahead of him. So your order could actually get front run by not using directed orders. It's the main thing as, you know, being at a prop firm or being at some place where you can direct your own orders. Um, it does help you to um, get a little bit of better execution and to help to reduce the slippage. Um, and read the tape. I didn't touch on this much either, but you can kind of read, um, basically, if you see, you know, on especially more on ill-liquid stocks, um, if you're seeing a lot of internalizers, a lot of transactions happening off exchange at the bid, that means they're leaning on the bid, which means there's a higher probability that, you know, they're going to try to drive the price higher. Um, that's all I've got for you here today, though. Um, I do obviously um, have the premarketinfo.com site, but we also have this new site, which I will just talk to you about briefly here. Um, this is still in beta here, but we are actually, um, we've launched a soft launch this week. So um, this is the new Benzinga Options House site. Um, this is uh, basically... Uh, going to be our new site as well. Um, we'll continue to update information, but we've got a live chat room here. This comes on at 8 o'clock every morning, goes to 9.45. I'm on there from about 8.10 till about 8.50. Um, and then I don't like trading the first half. Or I, I can't talk from 8.9 to 9.30 because I 
got to go get ready for my own open. So, but Joel stays on there throughout the open. Um, the Benzinga team stays on there throughout the open. So you'll have Jake and you'll have Brent and you'll have all these other guys from Benzinga breaking news as it happens. Um, Joel doing the analysis and the technicals on the stocks for the full hour, 45 minutes, pretty much. And obviously I'm on there for 45 minutes too, giving my analysis as well. Um, we're on there every morning. It's completely free right now. I don't know if it will be forever, but it is right now. Um, show pops on at 8. Brent and Jake usually open it up. We come on there at 8.10. And um, like I said, I'm on there until 8.50. We have a live chat room here where you can go on. You just log in. Um, you just have to give your email and you get a login. And basically can ask us questions. We field these questions as we go along. Um, and we're eventually hoping you know, to get quite a few people in here. We have not uh, promoted this at all. This has had zero promotion so far. So it's just you know basically word of mouth right now. So... Um, we are going to do a mass promotion on this once we get the bugs out. We had bugs yesterday morning. We've had a few bugs here um, because it's a new site. You're obviously going to get new bugs. But eventually what we're going to have is all of the top um, ratings changes, the analyst moves, upgrades, and downgrades. Eventually what you'll be able to click this and you'll be able to get them all. Um, the top earnings, you'll eventually be able to click that and you'll be able to go get all of your information there as too. All the stocks going ex-dividend, we're going to have that on there too. We're going to have special guests on there. We're actually interviewing an analyst tomorrow that's got a Netflix price target of 150 on there this is a nice thing like we've been doing pre-market info for so long uh, for the last year and a half me and Joel uh, but now that we are with Benzinga we have so much more access to so many more people um, they're gonna get us live interviews they're gonna get us all kinds of cool stuff so um, come on and check us out you know and we're taking suggestions right now if you see something you want on this site the programmers will put it on there so like um, this is you know an excellent asset for bright traders here right now you see something that we're missing or something you, you know that we didn't think of um, come tell us about it and we'll get that information on there for you and we're providing this all for free right now so if you're interested check it out um, it's, it's the, the site is optionshouse.benzinga.com uh, if there's any questions here I can field those now Rob do you have any questions or is there's more Um, there was a question to clarify end of day follow through. I think I kind of did that, um, but basically, what I typically see happen, and this is just from statistical, you know, maybe 55% of the time, or maybe it's even higher than that, maybe 60% of the time. Um, if we're up 10 points, 10 S and P futures points on the day, we will often have a run up into the close. In the last 10 or 15 minutes, we'll run up into the close, um, where you'll see us up 10. We might close up 13. If we are down 10 or 15 handles on the day, we will typically have a sell-off in the close. Now, this doesn't always 100% of the time, but like I said, this is you know more often than not. The reasons for that is the ETF rebalancing, which I touched on, um, and probably just you know people just playing momentum strategies through the through the overnight holding or through their overnight sessions as well. So, but I think it's a lot to do with the ETF rebalancing too. If there's more questions, Rob, um, I think I got one from BTM. Which site do you recommend for us to visit in the mornings before the open? <laughs> well, I guess I recommend them on our own site because I just did optionshouse.benzinga.com. Um, eventually, we want to kind of be like the one-stop shop for all this. Like, obviously, right now, you know, you've, you use your Twitter. You can use all kinds of different stuff. Um, but for the most part, we eventually want to have all of your pre-market information right here. That's what we were going to do on premarketinfo.com back in the day. But it was just too much, uh, like, because I'm a trader. Joel's a trader. Um, we were trying to do the show. And I'm like, well, I can't, you know, be posting all this information and trading. So I just couldn't physically do it. Now that we have the Benzinga team with us, like we have you know two or three guys dedicated to this site every morning, they're going to be posting the site as the stuff breaks. So um, once we get out of beta mode here, we're expecting you know that this is hopefully going to be the one-stop place to go for all your pre-market information. You'll come on here. What are the top upgrades? They're going to be right here in downgrades. What are the earnings? What's had or happened overnight? They're going to be right here. What are the ex-dividends? Um, we might even put the levels, different Gerald Jewels, different levels up there. Obviously, have the chat. You can come here and ask us a question. Ask the Benzinga team, what's going on with the stock? Benzinga will try to hunt that down for you, what's happening with it. Um, also, obviously, we're going to have this show. It says pre-market show is off the air right now. But from 8 to 9.45, this is just live. We're showing our screen. They've actually developed trading software for us because there was a whole bunch of hurdles to show software from other companies. So we've developed our own trading software, a quoting service that shows all this stuff. Um, what do I use right now besides that? I actually use the Benzinga Pro feed, um, which is another Benzinga product. So basically I have this here, which I can show you. This is Benzinga Pro. 
Um, and this is um, something I subscribe to. Um, it's, I believe, 125 a month. I think there's different levels, though, too. Uh, but as news breaks here, um, it's breaking in here. They're showing all that. You have all the calendars and stuff here, too. There's all your earnings here, all your ratings. So um, for me, I, because I have all this information, I don't need to go and try to find it for free on the web. Um, but if you're trying to find that information for free on the web, eventually, like I said, we want to be the place you go to for that, optionshouse.benzinga.com. Uh, but, you know, there's other places too. Um, you can go, it's not the problem with me, I don't even go anywhere else for free anymore because I have all those services that I subscribe to. Um, I know you used to be able to go to like disclosure.com, you used to be able to get um, the upgrades and downgrades um, from... Um, I think you can still get them from Market Watch. You can go get the upgrades and downgrades. So there's a few places you can go. But hopefully within the next few weeks, we're going to be the one-stop shop for you. If there's any other questions, I'll field those now. If not, we can uh, pass this back. Okay, well, I guess if there's no more questions, thanks, guys, for listening here today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm Dennis at premarketinfo.com. And um, have a great rest of the day, and uh, good luck with your trading.